Have you ever faced a distressing time in your life? Raise your hand. Are you going through one right now? When those times happen, and they do happen, you know, questions come to mind. Why is this happening? God, where are you at? Where's the power and the promises from Scripture I see? I don't seem to see it happening this time. Well, you're not the only one who's asked those questions, because Gideon and the Israelites were asking those exact same questions. So turn with me to Judges chapter 6, and we're going to look at the distressing time that Israel was going through, their questions, and then the hope that God provided for them. So let's start with a little history. So about 4,000 years ago, the Israelites were enslaved in Egypt, and God rescued them from Egypt, and Moses led them out of Egypt across the desert 5,000 miles to the land of Canaan. Well, on their way there, they stopped at Mount Sinai, and God gave them the Ten Commandments and made a covenant with them. God said, if you obey me, if you serve me, I will protect you. You'll never starve. You'll have complete protection from your enemies, and you will have success in the battle. The people said, yes, we will do our part. And like a New Year's resolution... It wasn't long until they started to break that. And they went through a cycle where they would break it, they would recommit and break. So Moses led them to the promised land, then Joshua led them into the promised land of Israel. And there they conquered the nations, they settled down. Joshua died, and then there was these individuals called judges that ruled and would lead the people. And they were civil leaders, they were religious leaders, and they were, in a sense, a king but not acting in a king capacity. And as we see in Judges, there was a cycle. Israel would disobey. They would be oppressed. God would let other nations come in and conquer them and oppress them as judgment. But more importantly, to turn them back to God. Israel would get tired of it. They would cry out to God. God would raise up a deliverer. Israel would be delivered. They would have peace. And then they would repeat the entire cycle again. So as we come to Judges chapter 6, they have had 40 years of peace. But now, verse 1, chapter 6. Then the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. They did evil. Now it's important to realize the difference between being human and diving into sin and doing evil. So when we lived in Kansas, we lived on a dirt slash sandy road. And after it rained, all the potholes would fill up with water. And we'd sometimes go out for a walk. Now, most of the family, the adults, would try and avoid the potholes, the mud, and would stay mostly clean. But we'd get some mud on their shoes, and we'd have to wipe them off. Okay, that's being human. You know, we sin, we confess, we seek to do what's right. But we still, we're sinners. That's human. My two-year-old, on the other hand, would look at every mud puddle as an opportunity to dive in and get those shoes dirty, get them muddy. So he was seeking out the mud puddles, and we were seeking to avoid them. So as we're going through the Christian life, yes, we sin, and we need to repent, we need to confess. But the Israelites, that wasn't where they were at. They were doing evil. They were embracing evil, rejecting God, and diving into sin. So they did evil in the sight of the Lord. And last part of verse 6, or verse 1, so the Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian for seven years, and the hand of Midian prevailed against Israel. Now, Midian might sound familiar, the Midianites, because they were actually relatives of the Israelites, clear back through Abraham. And also, they were the ones that brought Joseph, bought Joseph from his brothers and sold him into slavery. They were the ones that hired a prophet to curse Israel. So it always been like a thorn in the side of Israel. And it said here that God gave them into the hand of the Midianites for seven years. Well, what did that look like? 
Verse two, and the hand of Midian prevailed against Israel. Because of the Midianites, the children of Israel made for themselves the dens, the caves, and the strongholds which are in the mountains. So think about it. They had to leave their beautiful homes, hide out in the mountains, gather into strongholds. Verse three, so it was whenever Israel had sown, the Midianites would come up also a man. Amalekites and the people of the east would come up against them. Then they would encamp against them and destroy the produce of the earth as far as Gaza and leave no sustenance for Israel, neither sheep nor oxen nor donkey. For they would come up with their livestock and their tents, coming in as numerous as locusts. Both they and their camels were without number, and they would enter the land to destroy it. So just imagine that you have to eat so you plant crops, but right at harvest time, here comes the enemy. And they would take all your food. After seven years of that, they were brought low because of them. Verse 6, so Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites. They reached rock bottom, and the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. Now, here's what's interesting. It appears like it took them seven years before they got to the point of realizing this is not working. We need to turn to the God of the universe and quit following our other gods and cry out to him for help. And isn't it interesting in our own lives? We do the same thing. We'll try almost every possible solution. And it's like, you know, maybe I should pray about it. And it's cool that we live in a society where we have medical help available. You know, there's different financing options, etc. But oftentimes prayer is our last resort when it should be our first resort. So they cried out to the Lord for help. Now look at verse seven. When the people of Israel cried out to the Lord on the account of the Midianites, pause there. We see a, in scripture, a pattern where God would wait until his people cried out before he gave help. It's not that God didn't care, but he would Wait until the people realize their need for him before he would act. And we could for sure speculate, and I'd say it's true, if they had cried out year one, God would have sent help. So he waited until they cried out to him to help. Now notice something here. They does not appear they were crying out to God in repentance and confession of their sin. They were crying out to God because of their consequences and what they were experiencing. And the reason God had allowed this was to actually drive the people back to him. It was judgment, but because God's loving, he knew the best thing for them was to follow God. So he was allowing and causing this in their life to drive them to him. But this is so much like us too. Where when we get so wrapped up in life and the consequences of things going on, when we come to God, it's not out of confessing our sin, but it's because, God, I don't like the consequences. You talk to any counselor, and they'll tell you that people do not come in saying, you know, I have this real problem with selfishness and pride and not admitting my mistakes, and it is ruining my marriage, and I need help overcoming this sinful habit. Rarely, Do counselors ever hear that? What they hear is, you know, things aren't going well with my spouse. They're a real problem. Can you fix us? Can you help us? And the people here, they hadn't recognized their sin yet. So God sent a prophet. Now, a prophet, it was a spokesman for God. And this is what the prophet said to him, to the people. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I led you up from Egypt and brought you out of the house of slavery. And I delivered you from the hand of the Egyptians and from the hand of all who oppressed you and drove them out before you and gave you their land. So the prophet does a four-point sermon. Point one, I delivered you out of Egypt. Point two, I gave you this land. Point three, you have not obeyed my voice. And I said to you, I'm the Lord your God. You shall not fear the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell, but you have not obeyed my voice. So God blessed them. He said, you need to follow me, serve me, but no. 
They forsook God. So now God's told them the reason what's going on. And let's pick up in verse 11. Now the angel of the Lord came and sat under the terebinth at Ophrah, which belongs to Joash the Abizrite, while his son Gideon was beating out wheat in the winepress to hide it from the Midianites. So that a terebinth was actually a tree which they've got turpentine from. So there's this tree there at this town called Ophrah. And as this story was recorded, later on when people read this, it would make sense and they could visualize where this happened. So the angel of the Lord came to Gideon. Now in the Old Testament, you'll see this phrase, angel of the Lord. And theologians believe that that's actually a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus Christ, where he would show up in the Old Testament at various times, and he was called the angel of the Lord. So this was a divine message from God to Gideon. Verse 12, and the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, the Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor. So he makes an incredible statement. Gideon, the Lord is with you. You are mighty and you are brave. And Gideon's thinking, I'm none of these three. Verse 13, and Gideon said to him, please, my Lord, if the Lord is with us, and now he's going to ask three questions. The same questions you and I often ask when we are in distressing times. Here's the first question. Why, if, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? Have you ever asked this question? You're like, God, why is this happening? And what's even more challenging is when you feel like you're doing everything right and still life is falling apart. It's like, God, you say you're in control. Why are all these things happening to me? Then he moves on to the second question. And where are all his wonderful deeds that our fathers recounted to us? Saying, did the Lord bring us from Egypt? It's like, we hear these stories about God parting the Red Sea, delivering from Egypt. But here we are, being occupied, fighting for food for seven years. Where is the power? And have you wondered that too? Or you, you read about the promises and power in Scripture, but then you look at your life and go, man, where is the power of God? Well, then he asks the third question. But now the Lord has forsaken us and given us into the hand of Midian. So this isn't so much a question as a statement. But the question is, why have you forsaken us? We don't feel you. We don't see you working. Why have you left us? And I think these three questions are what all the Israelites were asking. Well, what's the answers? Before we get to the answers, let's be clear on one point. Every situation is a little bit different. The distressing times that Israel was going through, the answers to the question are different in that case than in another situation. Like when Joseph was in slavery, Joseph was going through all these challenging times. Why he was going through that was for God to prepare him to save the nation of Israel from starvation. When the apostle Paul was going through difficult times, the reason for that was because it would get the gospel out to more people. Okay? So every situation is a little bit different, but the principles we are about to look at apply all the time. Verse 14. And the Lord turned to him and said, Go in this might of yours and save Israel from the hand of Midian. Do I not send you? Well, here was the first question, the answer to the question of, Why has the Lord forsaken you? And the answer was this God did not leave you, you left God. I think of the story where you had this elderly couple, they had driven up to a stoplight, and the elderly wife looked to her side, and she saw this car, which one of those old-fashioned bench seats, and this young married couple, the wife was sitting right next to the husband, and they were making use of the stoplight downtime. 
They were kissing and just having a great time. And the elderly wife looked at her husband and said, why don't you kiss me and hug me at stoplights like you used to do when we were first married? And the elderly husband looked at the empty seat between them, looked at his wife and said, I never moved. Sometimes when we feel like God's forsaken us, who moved? In James, he writes, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. And it's not like we wake up one day and say, you know, I'm going to drift away from God and just backslide away from him. We just slip away, move across that seat. The point here is Israel had left God. God had never forsaken them. And we get to the next point. The prophet is what brought this out. And that is you need to return to obeying God. Since they had forsaken God, the answer was to return and start obeying him, obeying his voice. So with the Israelites, God spoke to them through scripture. He spoke to them by sending prophets. Today, we still have scripture. We also have the Holy Spirit that convicts us. And the way we return is get back to focusing on Jesus and obeying, responding to the conviction of the Holy Spirit. In Revelation chapter 2, we see an interesting verse about a church. And this church had many good things going for it. But as John writes, they had a problem. And here's the problem, Revelation 2, 4 through 5. But I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Man, think about that. That can apply in so many things. You've you've had a job you loved at first. You know, at first your marriage was going really good. Your parenting was going great. Your spiritual life was great. But now it's it's drifted. What's the answer? Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen... Repent and do the works you did at first. So we can think back to those times in our life where, you know, spiritually we were there. As we dissect that, we'll often see, you know, I was depending on God. I was praying. I was responding to the conviction. I was plugged into other believers. Return to that. And James 4, we just um, read about draw near to God and he will draw near to you. The very next verse says, cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be rich and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. The first step towards returning to God is to confess our sin. Not be broken about our consequences, but come to God and say, God, I have drifted from you. I have left you. And there is a cool psalm. It's called Psalms 51. And you can remember it because of Area 51. But Psalms 51 is David's confession after he committed adultery with Bathsheba. And you can take that psalm and you can pray through it just putting your sin that you've committed in place of what David wrote. It's a powerful exercise of realizing who we are and who God is. Now, we understand as believers, when we've trusted Jesus as our Savior, he forgives all our sins. But just like when your child sins and does something wrong, it puts a wedge in your relationship, sin also puts a wedge in our relationship with God. And that's why we need to confess so we can restore that fellowship with him. So thinking to your life, what do you need to return to do? What have you slipped from doing? Because God is calling us to return and follow him. Now, David's question is, you know, where's the power of God? And the angel gave the answer. Because Gideon was wanting deliverance. He was wondering, why is God not answering our prayers of delivering us from the Midianites? Verse 14. And the Lord turned to him and said, go in this might of yours and save Israel from the hand of Midian. 
do not I send you? You know what God's saying? You are the answer to the people's prayers. They have been praying for deliverance. You are the answer. And this is the principle we need to remember. You are the answer to someone's prayer. I remember reading this cartoon. We had these two characters walking along. And the first one said, sometimes I just want to ask God, God, why don't you do something about all this suffering, this evil, and people not hearing the gospel in the world? And the second character asked, well, why don't you ask him? And the first responded, because I'm afraid he'll ask me the same question. Think about that. There's people who are praying. They need spiritual help. They need physical help. And God often stirs in our heart to help those individuals. And we're actually the answer to their prayer. And Gideon was the answer to the Israelites' prayer. You can read the rest of the story this afternoon. But he had some excuses. He said, I'm not strong enough. My family is like the least in the nation. I'm the youngest. I can't do this. And the reply, verse 16, the Lord said to him, but I will be with you and you shall strike the Midianites as one man. God was going to use him to deliver them. So coming back to us, you and I can sometimes spend days, weeks, years praying for something, for God to show his power in a situation. Maybe God will raise up someone else. Now, don't take this the wrong way, but sometimes we are the answer to our own prayer. What I mean is God is, we're asking God to save us or deliver us from something. Maybe the answer is we return to God, repent, and start living life we're supposed to, and that is going to help in that. So to wrap this up, we face some distressing times as a nation individually. And then we have our personal struggles we're dealing with. But let's remember, God hasn't forsaken us. If we feel that, we're the ones who've forsaken God. We need to return to obeying God's voice because it's so easy to drift. And then third, you are the answer to someone's prayer. And God may have been stirring in your life for weeks now that you should maybe call someone, maybe change something, maybe volunteer for something. God wants to use you in a powerful way. Let's pray. Father, as we wrap this up, Lord, we can uh, see ourselves with the Israelites where it's so easy for us to drift. And as we're, everyone's we're sitting here, what is God teaching you? What is God convicting you? What do you need to repent of? What have you stopped doing that has kind of brought you away from your first love? And then also, you know, how has God been stirring in your life? Because you are the answer to someone's prayer.